Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Voice in the Wilderness Ministries, wherever you are. We are so thankful for all of our wonderful supporters, our intercessors, our friends in every church, every pastor, every member. We love you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for all you do. We certainly give gr glory to God and to the Lord Jesus Christ. We do that at all times, but we also want to acknowledge those people that believe in us and that support us and that love us. Your prayers and your love does not go un unthankful or unnoticed. We love you from the bottom of our hearts. This morning, I want to do a special service, a special message. Darren Godwin is our engineer and uh, producer of the videos, and Darren is a Marine, a retired Marine who valiantly served uh, the United States in uh, a lot of the wars or police actions that we have. And he fought fearlessly and faithfully for his country. And we just want you to understand the role and the value of a soldier, even in the kingdom of God. We are to have a soldier's mentality in dealing with life in the Christian faith. We have a natural enemy in the spirit world that we take for granted far too often. And we must maintain a soldier's mindset to deal with the attacks of the enemy and life itself with the power and confidence in knowing that God has called us and chosen us to fight the good fight of faith, to stand for Him and represent Him in the spiritual warfare that takes place for the souls of men. In 2 Timothy 2, the point is illustrated succinctly by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul when he says, You must therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has enlisted him to be a soldier. And if anyone competes in any sort of athletic endeavor, he is not crowned except he competes according to the rules. Every single person, either considering coming to Christ through the salvation of Jesus Christ, or who are now following Christ, must understand that a part of our walk with Christ involves the engagement of spiritual warfare with the forces of darkness. This warfare takes place within two realms, our own carnal nature, our own inner spirit, our own inner man, and the second is the spiritual realm itself. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, the Bible describes the kind of warfare that we engage in so that we don't get caught up in the things of this world, but we understand our warfare is of a spiritual nature designated by God for the purposes of victory over all the power of the enemy. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, our arsenal, our equipment, our toolbox, our armory is not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into the captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, when it implies and uses the word war or warfare, I am not referring to worldly hand-to-hand -hand combat but its proper designation is spiritual warfare. This renders the capacity for human victory useless. Victory can only come through the faith of the operation of the Spirit of God that goes through a believer that lives their life by faith. It must come through the operation of the Spirit of God. Carnal weapons such as human ingenuity, wealth, talent, organizing ability, networking, 
eloquence, charisma, and personality are unto themselves alone powerless to pull down the strongholds of Satan. Ephesians 6, 10-13 describes the attitude and the motive with which Christians are to understand how this works. In Ephesians 6, 10-13 it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against all the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take the whole armor of God that you may withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now, Darren is a military man here. Darren would never, ever go out into battle without having every single weapon he needed to keep him and his men alive. He was a leader in the military. He understood that he had to be prepared over and above all of the rest around him that counted on him. And if you're a pastor or you're a preacher or you're a leader in a church, you must understand that you have to live and understand you must be prepared for the battles that will come your way, and they will come your way. The only people that the devil does not bother are, bother with are those that are no threat to his kingdom. If you are going through a state of depression because you feel like you're under attack by the devil, it simply means you are living in God's will for your life. You pose a great threat to the devil, and he will throw the entire kingdom at darkness to keep you from fulfilling God's will. So you have to understand that God wants you to be prepared for the attacks of the enemy as you carry out God's will on this earth. And if you're going to be saved and you're going to be coming to salvation, this is part of your walk with God. And it may not have anything to do with your salvation, but you are called to win souls. You're called to engage the enemy. You are called to set the captive free. You're called to liberate those that are bound. You are called to heal the sick. You are called to cast out devils, literally, spiritually, or otherwise. You have the power of the Holy Spirit living in you. The tragic irony in the church today is we are trying to meet the challenge of this unprecedented rise of evil among us and upon the world with the weakest and most unqualified people using carnal means and worldly wisdom. Be not deceived. Humanistic wisdom, philosophy, psychology, exciting attractions, church entertainment packages, crusades, conferences, meetings, seminars, false prophecies, innumerable self-improvement messages, and an insincere and uncommitted laity do not serve as a substitute for the New Testament demands of intense, fervent prayer, <coughs> excuse me, an uncompromising commitment to the Word of God, and a fervent and passionate proclamation of the gospel to all the world. If the church continues to rely on the world's methodologies, it will not only secularize the church, but it will eventually separate its, itself from the power of the Holy Ghost. Tragically, the church itself will, this church itself will become overshadowed by the power of darkness and its families will be cast away. Ultimately, the climax of this recklessness is found in Revelation 3. In Revelation 3, 14-22, the Bible says, And to the angel of the church of Laodicea, write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, how that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I am rich and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, but you are spiritually and miserably poor, blind, wretched, and naked. I counsel of you to buy of me gold that is tried in the fire, that you may be rich, and white clothing that you may be clothed, and the shame of your nakedness be not revealed, and anoint your eyes with I salve that you may see. The Bible says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, 
Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me on my throne as I have also overcome and have sat down at my Father's throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To combat this lethal march of self-destruction, excuse me, to combat this inward lethal march of self-destruction, we must maintain our individual discipline as well as our corporate church discernment and rely on the weapons of warfare we have been allocated to defend ourselves against this rising tide of deception upon this earth. We must be willing to fight the good fight. We must be willing to enter this race. We must be willing to maintain and keep our faith until our last breath here on earth. 1 Corinthians 9 24 through 27, the Bible says, Do you not know that they which run in a race run all, but only ones receives the prize? So run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone that competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we an imperishable one. Therefore I run thus, not as uncertainly. Thus I fight not as one that beats the air, but I keep under, I bring, I discipline my body and I bring it under subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I may be disqualified. Let me share this. There's a lot of noise about preachers falling from, being toppled from their perch. It is your responsibility if you are a preacher or a pastor or a teacher or a leader, it is your responsibility to control yourself. Your anointing, your call, your popularity, your ability to influence people, your ability to raise money means nothing in the sight of God if you can't keep yourself under control. He will topple you, he will embarrass you, and he will scatter your flock because there's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. And you don't have to be Phi Beta in military and soldier service to know that you do not disobey orders and do things your own way. It is recorded historically that Paul wrote most of his letters from a jail cell in Rome. This would require a Roman soldier to stand guard and watch. The Holy Ghost, while Paul was there, would inspire Paul to use the Roman soldier's army as relatable symbolic references to the type of spiritual armor that believers are supposed to engage wickedness with. Let me outline just exactly what these weapons are. <clears throat> the summation is in Ephesians 6, 14-18 when it says, Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all of the darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching there unto with all supplication and perseverance for all saints. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 8, the armor is also referenced in that scripture when it says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and as a helmet the hope of salvation. Let's look at these in their proper order. Number one, he wants your waist to be girded with truth, similar to a belt. In other words, he wants you to wear a belt of truth. It is from the belt of truth that all of the other power and, and, and tools and weapons come from. Verse 14, stand, or, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth. <coughs> Excuse me. The belt is the first piece of armor a Christian soldier arms himself with. It is a belt that secures the rest of the tools or armor being carried. Any, any soldier girded with this belt 
testifies that he is a warrior ready and prepared for battle at any time. This belt consists of every form of truth. Absolute truth is the counterweapon of the deception of the lies of Satan and his demonic goons. There cannot even be the appearance of deception anywhere in our life if you're going to properly be girded with this truth. Ephesians 6, 14, once again, the Bible says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. In Psalm 18, verse 32, the Bible says, It is God that girds me with strength and makes my way, and make, excuse me, it is God that girds me with strength and makes my way with strength. In Luke 12, 35, the Bible says, Let your wet Jesus speaking to his disciples, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. In 1 Peter 1, verse 13, the Bible says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that shall be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. To be ready for any battle, we must be completely truthful to ourselves in our inner being, just like our Creator. We also have to be completely honest with people. And we live in an age of mass deception, even justifiable in some people's eyes. It is vitally important that when you deal with the Lord Jesus Christ, when you deal with God the Father, when you tell the world you have the Holy Ghost in you, you are operating in a complete atmosphere of absolute truth. There can be no deception in our lives. We must all strive to be honest and truthful in everything we do, and that is a job. But if you can master it, if you can become that kind of person, then you'll never have to worry about something you said coming back to bite you. You will live a life of peace with God, never having to try to remember what you said when you knew it wasn't right. In John 8, 32, the Bible says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 17, 17, Thy word is truth. Actually, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. In Ephesians 4, 15, the Bible says, Speaking the truth in love. Number two, the breastplate of righteousness. Paul got this in... Well, let me see here. Let me not get ahead of myself. Ephesians 6, 14, the Bible says, Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The believer is introduced to the concept of biblical righteousness at our conversion. That is when the believer repents of their sins and is forgiven by the grace and the mercy of God. Reconciliation, reconciliation with God is accomplished through the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which redeems us and justifies us and makes us righteous in the sight of God. Then in gratitude, we should pursue a righteous life by doing what is right in God's eyes. God himself sets an example in the Old Testament, and this is where Paul gets the inspiration for this statement. In Isaiah 59, 17, God himself puts, puts on righteousness as a breastplate. God himself puts righteousness on as a breastplate. Isaiah 59, 17. So he understood exactly what that meant when he saw that piece of armor. In Romans 6, verse 13, the Bible says, Do not present your bodies as instruments of unrighteousness to sin but present yourselves to God as those that are alive from the dead and your bodies as instruments of righteousness unto God. Ephesians 4, 24. The Bible says, Put on the new man, which is created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. In 1 Timothy 6, 11, the Bible says, But you, man of God, Flee those things that are talked about in the previous. It talks about the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. In other words, those people in the Christian faith that are all about money, 
pierced themselves through with many sorrows, and most have actually erred from the faith, supposing that gain is godliness. So the Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, tells Timothy, But you, man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness in the sight of God. In Philippians 3, 9 and 10, And be found in Him, being found in Christ, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death, if that by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 34, the Bible says, Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. Number three, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Ephesians 6.15, the Bible says, In having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The word preparation, <coughs> excuse me, the word preparation used here is the Greek word which means readiness. It reminds us that we are to be eager to preach the gospel of peace. You should be eager to preach the gospel of peace to all of this world. It should be upon your heart to reach as many lost souls with the gospel. You should be ready, instant in season, to anyone that comes into your life with the good news of Jesus Christ and His salvation and reconciliation to the Father. The church of God is sent to announce the good news of God's kingdom which will spread His way of peace around the world. Much of the success of the ancient armies was attributed to the footwear they used. They emphasized shoes, excuse me, shoes that were made to undertake long marches at incredible speeds over rough terrain. Often equipped with nails and even spikes that could hold firm to the ground, God's good news and our marching orders to preach the gospel are our firm foundation. In Isaiah 52, Verse 7, the Bible says, How beautiful upon the mountains are they are the feet of them which bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, who proclaim salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. And if Romans 10, verse 15, the Bible says, As it is written, he, Paul quotes the same verse in Romans, As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, that bring glad tidings of good things. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24, again, the Bible says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, so run that you may obtain. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. In Hebrews 12, verse 1, the scripture says, Therefore we also, since we are so surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. Next is the shield of faith. The shield of faith. Ephesians 6, verse 16, the Bible says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you shall be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked. The shield of faith that protects us from the darts of the enemy is a faith that sees eternal realities, experiences God's power, and loves Christ to such an extent that Satan darts, Satan's darts of sinful pleasures, secular values, ungodly ways, and the selfish materialism of the world have no lasting effect upon our faith in Christ. Faith means more than just believing God exists. It means that we believe that everything that God does for us is good. Faith is the belief that God will always do what He promised. In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, the Bible says, Watch, stand ye in the faith, be brave, be strong. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. In Galatians 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And this life I live now on this earth, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 1 Timothy 6, 12. Fight the good fight 
of faith. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. In 1 John 5, verse 4, the Bible says, Whatsoever is, whosoever is born of God, or whatsoever is born of God, overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. The helmet of salvation is next, and then the sword of the Spirit. These are the Word of God. In Ephesians 6, verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let me explain to you what I'm talking about here. The helmet of salvation is your thought life. The reason it goes on in your head is that's where you think. You need to have the Word of God to be able to recall it. I am a firm, most of you, anyone who's ever known me is I am a firm believer in memory scripture. Memory scripture is that tool that God gives you when you're out somewhere that you can recall as God needs you to use it. So scripture memorization is vitally important for an effective witness in this world. Now, if all you're doing is showing off to other Christians, don't waste your time with that. This is for the express purpose of fulfilling God's will for your life as it relates to your call in this world. This is not an item to bicker back and forth on the internet about. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. You can win the battle and lose the war and become so heavenly minded you're no earthly good and that is a true axiom. Some people all they do is want to argue about the Bible. You need to have head knowledge in your head so you understand that when you are somewhere and you may not have your Bible with you, or you may be caught off guard, or you're in a place where you can't open a Bible, that God has instilled in you the knowledge of His Word to use it as the situation arises based on your faith and confidence of the Word which He's placed inside of you in the first place. This is what I'm referring to when I'm talking about the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation is your biblical thought life. The thoughts of the enemy say that I'm no good. How many Christians really believe that they're no good? How many live in depression? How many live in bondage? How many literally are imprisoned by the words of the devil or an evil person that keeps them from being all they can be? This is to guard your heart against those spiritual and human forces sent by the devil to sabotage your walk. If you're going to do anything for God, there's always going to be somebody that's not going to like it and criticize you. Usually because they're too afraid to do what God's called them to do, they find it easier to knock someone off their perch than actually try to do something for God themselves. So you have to guard yourself against all of that. All of us make mistakes. God forgives our mistakes. I will not let the devil defeat me in my thoughts. I am a child of God. The Bible says in Romans 12 too, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Ephesians 4.23, the Bible says, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In Colossians 3, 9 through 10, the Bible says, Do not lie one to another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. The sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, is the believer's singular offensive weapon to be used in our warfare with the devil and the world. For this reason, Satan will make every effort to undermine or destroy your trust and confidence in God's holy word. The singular greatest satanic gains in the church are in the ignorance and the abuses of leaders who do not rightly divide the word. Every Christian, I don't care where you go to church, I don't care who your pastors are, I don't care who your mentors are, I don't care who you look up to, I don't care who you think is, should be on the spiritual Mount Rushmore, it is your responsibility, and you must take it upon yourself to be 
thoroughly prepared in your hearts to defend the inspired scriptures against allegations that it is not God's word in everything it teaches. To abandon the position and attitude of Christ and the apostles towards God's inspired word is to destroy its power to convict or to correct, to redeem, to heal, to drive out demons, and to overcome all evil. Any man in a position of authority that denies its complete trustworthiness in all it teaches is an agent of Satan sent to tempt you and your faith in Christ. 2 Timothy 2.50, the Bible says, Be diligent to present yourselves approved unto God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 4, 2-4, Preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn their ears away from the truth and be turned unto fables. Hebrews 4, 12 through 13, the Bible says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and a marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him we have to do. James 1, 18, and James 1, verse 21. Of his own will he brought us forth with the word of truth, that we might be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. In verse 25, the Bible says, Wherefore lay aside all filthiness and your overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. In 1 Peter 1, 23, 1 and 23, 1 Peter 1, 23, verse 23, having been born again, not of corruptible but incorruptible seed through the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Let me take one more minute here. I have seen an alarming number of pastors and teachers and particularly televangelists that believe it's a waste of time to study and get an education in this. Let me tell you something. They are agents of Satan. Any minister on television, in a church, in a ministry of any kind that does not think that regular study and growth in the Word of God is essential to understanding the will of God has been sent by Satan. Why would anybody in their right mind ever say anything like that? And I've heard it a lot lately. Any teacher that says that you don't need to grow in the knowledge of the Lord through His Holy Word is an absolute counterfeit preacher, teacher, and I don't care if they're standing before a football stadium with hundreds of thousands of people. It's still wrong, and it's high time that we start calling out some of this nonsense. There are certain things in the Scripture that we'll never understand. We are never going to get this all. But to simply say it's easier and it's better for you to just ignore it and worship is a cardinal mark of a satanic agent sent by hell to destroy you. And the irony is you actually want to hear them speak when they say that nonsense. Think for yourself. Prove every minister. Prove every teacher. Prove every pastor. I have a ton of mentors that I respect, but I guard my heart because nobody's beyond making a mistake, even an, unattention, even an unintentional one. Guard your heart from the nonsense you're hearing by uneducated and unqualified people that want to try to be wise and popular behind a pulpit. Lastly, fervent prayer and supplications. Ephesians 6.18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, 
with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Christians engaging in spiritual warfare must rise to a different level of prayer. This kind of prayer is intensified and is to be much more frequent in nature. Consider the terms praying in the Spirit, always and with all perseverance and supplication. These are not shallow words. Prayer is not just another weapon to be used, but prayer is the essential part of any engagement in a conflict with evil. The measure of offered prayer of faith is the determining factor in the victory that comes to us and our co-laborers with God. The failure to diligently pray with every kind of prayer in all situations is to cease from the battle and to surrender to the enemy. In Luke 18, verse 1, the Bible says, Then he spoke a parable unto them that men ought to always pray and not quit. Romans 12, 12, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Colossians 4, verse 2. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant and it's with thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Luke 21. Verse 36, the Bible says, Watch therefore and pray always, that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. The good soldier, equipped with the armor of God, is a warrior for his kingdom. The benefit of carrying the armor of God carries with it several biblical implications. For example, a good soldier in 2 Timothy 2.3 endures hardness as a good soldier of the kingdom of God. In Matthew 5 and 10, Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12, we suffer for the gospel. We endure this warfare. We are persecuted and we suffer opposition for the gospel. In 1 Timothy 6, 10, a good soldier fights the good fight of faith. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3, we wage war with evil. We do not wage war with men. We wage war with evil and the evil spirits that drive the conduct of evil men. In Ephesians 6.18, we persevere. In Romans 8.37, we conquer. In 1 Corinthians 15.57, we are victorious in Christ Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 2.4, uh, 2 Corinthians 2.14, we triumph over evil. In Philippians 1 verse 6, we defend the gospel. In Philippians 1.27, we strive for the faith. In Philippians 1.28, we are not alarmed by threats. In Ephesians 6.14, we stand firm. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4, we destroy satanic strongholds. In 2 Corinthians 10.5, we take captive every thought of every temptation or device or trappings of the enemy that seduces our faith and compromises our walk with God. In Hebrews 11.33, we become mighty in war. And in Jude 3, we contend for the faith. As this evil day rises, and you can see it all around you, I do not have to paint an elaborate portrait of the level of evil that seeks to consume everything in this world right now. Our world is going through a process it has not seen in human history. There has never been more danger to even an unborn child than there is right now. From the old man to the little baby, we are to defend those who cannot defend themselves. We are to fight the good fight of faith, and it's through our prayers that we will hold back on the judgment of God that's coming to this earth. The primary purpose of what we do is that we present the gospel. And if you're considering presenting the gospel, you must understand that if you're going to present the gospel, then you're going to have to understand the devil knows that too, and he's going to send a ton load of opposition. Now, Christianity has gone through a radical crisis influx point. Since COVID happened in 2019, to the, uh, late 2009, uh, excuse me, in March of 2020, Christianity has gone, undergone a winnowing process. Those that were in Christianity for all the wrong reasons have left and not come back. Those that were in Christianity that were using pulpits 
and using media devices to manipulate the people through spiritual deception and manipulation and an overplay sense of self-improvement and individual and worldliness now are beginning to topple like a house of cards because they can't control their own behavior and thus God is calling all of us in the judgment. There is very little that's going to prevent the final judgment, but we have a window here where we can speak to this world and for a short time longer offer the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who are hungry and want to come to God that know that eternity is real, that heaven is real, and hell is real, and they just want to know the truth and the difference. They just, want to, they just want peace with God. They know that there's an end to their life, and they just want peace with God. And as we close this, let me just offer this to you. You can have peace with God. All you have to do is bow your heart and confess and repent of your sins and then believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for the remainder of your time, committing your whole life to Him and everything He represents. And then for every day after that, you are to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Him. You're to follow God for the rest of your life. Subsequently, when you have done that, God will introduce the Holy Spirit to your heart, and He will live in there, and He will preserve you, He will protect you, He will help you. He's called Parakletos, the Comforter, for a reason. He will be there in the hard times, and He will help you celebrate in the good times. This is a wonderful walk with Jesus Christ. This is a wonderful time to be a Christian. You have been called of God for the last end days harvest. You should embrace that call as a badge of honor from God. I pray that you do that. This ministry is called to do that, and as long as we have this privilege, that is what we're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen.